how will the Indian banking industry supply credit towards the vision of a five trillion economy that has been laid out, and while doing so, go through pretty fundamental transformation and disruption on several counts. There are three points that I would like to make. One is to talk a little bit about the rise and uh, in importance of the non-banks in our ecosystem, which are here to stay and which need uh, very special treatment and recognition. Second is the demand that is being put on the banking system to raise its game so that it can really provide a consistent supply of credit, especially to the commercial sector towards the vision of a five trillion economy. What does it take and what will it do to the banking system's landscape? These demands on raising their capabilities. And sir, I would like to end by a few requests and suggestions for policy and for regulations. So the non-bank's importance is not new to us. You know, speakers before me talked about uh, the non-bank finance companies. I would just like to put some data on the table to show that the non-bank finance used to be a significant part of the Indian banking system. It became a dominant part of the banking system for certain important segments last year. This chart shows that about 40% of total new loans, 40%, larger than any other segment, last year to small businesses, SMEs, and to retail and housing combined were driven by non-bank finance. And it was not just an urban phenomenon, as you can see on the chart, it's urban it is 50, 49% and 32% in the rural, the smallest parts of the country. And what's more, for new to credit customers, meaning people who have never taken a loan before, first time loan takers, this ratio was 59%. So non-bank finance is here to stay. We believe that some of the liquidity issues that are here and that we have been dealing with are temporary, but we need to really take this occasion to step back and reflect on creating a framework to really encourage a stable but robust growth of non-banks in the country who will complement the banking sector towards supply of credit. That non-banks are actually going to be a part of the banking system is a much more intrusive manner than just non-bank finance. So let me take the example of UPI, which has been our uh, you know, poster child of innovation, if you will, among all the countries in the world. You know, BCG makes a case study of UPI everywhere, to all countries. India is poised to be a poster child of disruption in banking, and let me show to you how. So in about two or three years from the launch, UPI transactions are today about 17% of the total transactions that Indian banking system deals with, and they are very fast growing. If Mr. Nilakeni's digital committee recommendations were to come true, and we hope they will, this chart in three years, maybe five, will look like this. It is a complete transformation of the shape of the transaction landscape of Indian banking industry. While this fact is interesting in itself, if you juxtapose this with the fact that most of these transactions, UPI transactions, are controlled by non-banks. And these are not any non-banks, these are not small NBFCs in there, these are joint fintechs with our publicly owned digital infrastructure, which is unique to India and a pride of India. We permit global technology giants to come face to face and compete with banks for, we Indian banks will be subjected to one of the most fierce competition to get customers' attention. One might say, what's the big deal? This is just payments. This is not credit. So why are you talking about it? I'm talking about it because this is not just payments. This is data for transactions, which just goes and resides with the non-banking industry. And it's just a matter of time that entire credit flow, maybe not entire credit flow, a large part of credit flow will be heavily driven by data analytics in order to understand credit risks, in order to understand early warning systems, in order to understand right propositions for customers. So let us just see what happened in China. And some of these things change so fast that our impressions can be quite outdated. In China, this chart is basically showing all the consumption expenditure, not online, offline, in mom and pop stores, in the, sh in the shops, on the roads. Total consumption expenditure of the population of China has grown like this. In last two years, this is the pace with which mobile-based transactions at the point of sale have transformed the China's, China's market. And these are more than 50% of all the transactions that happen in China today, in just last three years, 
are on third party mobile uh, apps. So these are Alipay and WeChat, which control the 56% of transaction, and soon it will be much higher. There are just a few handful of banks in China who are able to negotiate with uh, WeChat, Tencent, the parent company, to say, give me the data. Give me rich data about the transaction, because I also want to keep it. Many banks have given up, they say, okay, data is yours. And you can imagine if data is yours, then the future is yours. India's payment system, as we all know, is much better than anybody else. We have got a public platform which allows open competition. That's not the case in China. So with our open platform, this should happen actually faster, provided certain policy recommendations were to be really pursued. Now, that is not just the end of the story. Why we believe that disruption through non-banks is going to be even bigger is China does not have consent-based data sharing protocol that we have just launched. As a matter of fact, no country really has it, despite the fact that Europe has had some you know, edge over us in terms of launching it. We believe that our consent-based data sharing protocol will be up and running in a matter of few months. And that is going to force segmentation of Indian banking industry around horizontal lines. By horizontal lines means there is a customer interface that will be competed for by a certain set of players, product and services, and infrastructure. There are three different layers in which the stacks in which the Indian banking sector will... Uh, uh, now, currently, banks operate everywhere. They have customer interface, they have some infrastructure, they manage products and services, there are a bunch of banks. The infrastructure below that market is increasingly becoming sophisticated and diverse. We have got payment uh, you know, uh, schemes, NPCI, Visa, MasterCard, we have got bureaus, one of the best in the world. We have got data service providers, now bolstered by the NBFC AA that have been launched, and of course, UIDI. But what is going to be the most fabulous, fascinating story is that we will have the top layer with multiple players. We just talked about payments. We will have non-bank finance companies, the second version of those, because the second version of NBFCs will be able to not only take funds from the banks and online, they will take data from the banks at customer's consent, and hence will have much, much higher ability to create propositions for customers, which otherwise they would not be able to. And we will have another set of players who are going to take data from banks and create, you know, account management, wealth management propositions, which never existed. So a different set of players. And then, God forbid, we might also have, you know, Alipay type of ecosystems, which actually combine experience from multiple different industries to create a platform where customers just don't want to leave. And then banking is just embedded in it, like we are seeing in China. So this is the landscape that we are expecting to see, three years, maybe five. This will put a lot of demand on Indian banks to up their capability levels. The data will determine how the credit flow will take place. Now, on the topic of credit, I would like to highlight certain observations about how the credit flow has taken place in last one year. We all know that there has been a slowdown, but you can see a very distinct difference in the way retail consumer credit has uh, behaved versus the way small business and SME credit has behaved, and it has very profound implications on how uh, you know, things will move forward in terms of landscape. So in retail loans, we found that the industry capabilities across the board are very good. While the credit growth declined from 25% to 16% last year, you know, across the board we found whether it is NBFCs, public sector banks, private sector banks, the NPA ratios fell. Normally when growth rates come down, the NPA ratios go up they fell, or they stayed constant by and large range bound. And if you see the data from the Bureau, actually the percentage of customers who had better scores, actually they went up. So industry was able to tighten their standards. Retail credit is simple. Industry has mastered it. Every segment of industry has mastered it. Yes, there will be ups and downs depending upon the uh, demand, but industry is able to keep pace with it and, and maintain the consistency of its supply. The same is not in the SME space. SME space is an order of magnitude more complicated and difficult to manage when it comes to risk. You know, it is not as simple as taking a score from the bureau and, and taking a decision on the basis of that. Not to say that that is how it is done in retail, but SME is just much more complicated. And here, on the same metrics, the industry could not tighten its standards. Uh, the NPA performance was quite varied, and shall I say, different segments had, you know, challenges. And certain segments had huge challenges. You know, at 10 plus percent NPA ratio, it is quite natural for a bank to stop lending because it doesn't make sense. No investors will per, uh, permit that. And we had a very different response. We had obviously the credit growth falling down to early 20s. 
but we had a complete stoppage of uh, uh, lending from public sector banks, rightly so. If the NPA levels are so high, why should that happen? So it is not just a demand side issue, it is a supply side issue. And it is one of the examples of the demands on enhancing technology, data analytics, and talent capabilities that the banking sector has. And all the banks need to do it. All the banks may not be able to do it because some of these things require scale. Let's take another example. I mean, so we actually looked at the SME lending process maturity across different players. You will see red ones are, you know, these are different players. Red ones are at a very low level. Yellow ones are at medium level. Green ones are at very high level. We find that different segments are at a different level of maturity and SME credit cannot be sustained at low level of maturity given how complex the ecosystem is becoming. And so in order to create consistent supply of credit to commercial sector, which is so important to us, the capability levels of Indian banking sector have to really go up. Of course, obviously the non-banks are you know, waiting in the heels to really take over uh, uh, if that doesn't happen. Our study in China, where as you know, artificial intelligence is quite mature that China is leading the world in artificial intelligence. And we did a study to say, over the next five to seven years, artificial intelligence-based applications will have what impact on the banking industry? And here are the results, which are quite surprising. 22% of manpower will not be needed because they will be replaced by AI-based applications. And for the remaining 80% of people, their efficiency can go up by 40%. You can imagine that banks who will adopt artificial intelligence will have phenomenal impact in terms of cost productivity over the others. Sir, the difference between the performers and the non-performers is increasing by the day, and it is only widening, whether it is on ROA, the profitability metrics, or productivity metrics, revenue per employee. The players who have scaled, who are able to invest, their performance is in, I mean, improving, or the gap is widening by the day. So this really highlights the need for accelerated consolidation in the Indian banking sector. It is an idea whose time has come, and it has to be taken up both in public sector and private sector space. Then another important thing is that we have talked about specialization of the banks. All banks cannot be fully digitized, full service banks. Maybe some large ones will have the appetite to invest. Some others have to specialize in a narrow space, vertically. And some others have to specialize in a narrow space, horizontally. And they can rely on partners, non-bank partners, to reach to the customers. So that idea is also something that our banking industry is more ready than anywhere else to really uh, uh, consider. And finally, we need a lot of new capital to be brought into the Indian banking sector. And so we need to think about new bank licenses. Many other countries in Asia Pacific have talked about new bank licenses. They talked about a lot of digital banks. Maybe that's not the right one for India. But we need to really put on uh, a request for review of our universal and differentiated bank licenses to really attract new capital into the country. So I will summarize with some implications for policy and regulations. Expedite consolidation, encourage digital transformation. Profitability of banking and non-banking sector is very important for attracting the capital, and huge capital is needed in this sector to support the growth. Encourage differentiated business models of banks. And finally, support the growth of a vibrant and stable non-bank ecosystem. Thank you very much, sir.